Excellent. Welcome, everybody. We are just letting, uh, giving a few seconds for people to kind of get into the room. It'll probably start letting more of you in. Um, thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, I'm Mindy Buchanan. I'm the Director of Patient Programs at the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jenny Tavi. She's a neuromuscular specialist and chief of neurology at National Jewish Health. Uh, she's a special interest in neurosarcoidosis as well as peripheral neuropathy. Uh, she's currently looking at how, to, how um, the immune system may cause small fiber neuropathy and sarcoidosis and other autoimmune disorders and is investigating potential treatment options to help patients with this condition. She's also involved in research studies evaluating the effects of integrative holistic therapies on chronic neurological diseases and has led meditation retreats for patients, physicians, and U.S. Marines returning from the Gulf War through the Wounded Warriors Program. Uh, so welcome, Dr. Tabby. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I wanted to start with some numbers. First of all, sarcoidosis is pretty rare. It affects about one in 100,000 people. In some populations, it's 40 per 100,000. Um, so what I tell my patients is, you won the negative lottery. Um, Fortunately, most people go into remission. About 80% of patients will go into remission with treatment. The problem is the treatment itself can cause side effects. Um, has anyone out there heard of prednisone, right? So many of you, most of you actually have been on steroids. I know in patients uh, with neurosarcoidosis, over 80% will start with steroid therapy. And as you uh, know firsthand, steroids cause you know, uh, irritability, poor wound healing, weight gain. Um, I've had a few patients lose weight, but by and large, most people gain weight. Thin skin, you just barely rub the skin and you can tear it. Um, <clears throat> cataracts, it just goes on and on and on. I had one patient tell me, I was on so much steroids, my wife had side effects. But the good news is that there is something you can do. And these are called integrative holistic therapies or lifestyle modifications. And along with your team of doctors, you are going to get better. It gets better. All right, so when I talk about integrative holistic therapies, um, if I can get this to advance, uh, oops, sorry. There are three basic tenets I always talk about. The first is nutrition, um, using food as medicine. The second is exercise. The third is mind-body therapies, different kinds of meditation. Now, the fourth, I will talk about supplements, vitamins, things like that. I'm not crazy about these supplements just because you really don't know what you're getting. These are not FDA approved. I mean, there are some websites that say, oh, well, we vetted the best um, supplements out there. But the problem is a lot of these websites uh, get uh, funding from the actual pharmaceutical company or the drug company. And they did this study where they looked at valerian root. Valerian root is an herb that uh, people take for insomnia. I've taken it. It smells like the Dickens. You have to keep it underneath the sink because it smells so bad. But they looked at the contents of a valerian root. This lab like uh, looked at the actual microscopic contents. And actually, a few of them didn't even have valerian root in them. A couple of them said that they had, oh, we had this much, and they didn't. And two had lead. So again, you really don't know what you're getting. All right, so the first thing I talk about is using food as medicine. The Chinese have been doing this for thousands of years. And one of the best recommendations is to make sure you get enough omega-3 fatty acids. This is found in fish. If you hate fish, then there are flax seeds and walnuts. Um, people always ask, well, how much should I take? You'll see ratios on the bottle, three to two, two to three, it doesn't matter. Look for something called three to two, and they're just looking for the different kinds of um, acids. How much do I take? What is the dose? So there's not a great dose, because again, you don't really know what you're getting, but we know from the large stroke trials and the, uh, the heart disease trials that two to three grams is a little bit too much. And the reason why is when you cut yourself, you're gonna see that you bleed. It causes some blood thinning. So maybe one to two grams is best. This is great for stroke, for heart disease. Uh, it might help for Alzheimer's. The, the, the 
research is still out there for it, but uh, it might even help for neuropathy. And they've been looking at seal oil, not fish oil, seal oil. And I know how I feel about that, but seal oil and neuropathy, and that might help with diabetic nerve regeneration. All right. And oh, did you know that even just a little bit of uh, walnuts has as much fatty omega-3 fatty acids as fish? Now, another thing that people are concerned about is there's a fishy afterbirth taste. If you don't want that, put the, the capsules in the freezer and take one out at a time, and then you won't get that fishy afterbirth taste. All right. The second major recommendation is to get your fruits and vegetables. Five servings a day. This is the American Heart Association, CDC, and American Cancer Society recommendation for each daily serving. And people say, there is no way I'm going to get five fruits and vegetables. Yes, you can. It's not that hard. So in the morning, have a banana, maybe some blueberries. That's two. And then for lunch, you have a little bit of a salad as a side salad or your main salad. That's three. Uh, in the afternoon, have a snack of an orange or an apple four, and then at dinner, you just have a vegetable, and that's already five. When you're shopping for fruits and vegetables, look for the brightly colored ones because the antioxidants and all the good things in there are in the pigments. And again, this is great for uh, cancer, it's good for heart disease, uh, it's good for autoimmune diseases, it's just good all around. Um, you now, for patients with diabetes, you do have to be careful, especially those with steroid-induced diabetes. So you have to stay to uh, stick to low sugar content fruit. So red grapes, love them, but they're out. Sorry. Uh, things like um, bananas are also high in sugar, but I've read that some peaches are low, berries are low, especially blueberries and strawberries. So there are some fruit that you can have. And you don't have to go fancy. I think you've seen maybe they're called Asahi berries from Brazil. It's an A and a funny C and AI. It's Asahi. But um, blueberries are great. And they even have the same compound as a drug for Alzheimer's disease and acetylcholinesterase. And it can be like Aricept. I mean, that's the same drug that Aricept has. Uh, they did this study where they took old mice and young mice. They fed the old mice a blueberry chow, and they fed the young mice a uh, mouse chow, whatever they eat. And then they put them in a water maze, and the older mice actually outperformed the younger mice. All right, nuts. That's another great recommendation. Nuts have antioxidants, vitamins, minerals, essential fatty acids. These are all great for you. Again, I told you, a small serving of salmon has the same amount of omega-3 fatty acids as walnuts. Cashews have copper and magnesium. These are both needed for your brain and your spinal cord. Brazil nuts have selenium. That's an antioxidant. I know patients with prostate cancer and even ALS have taken selenium. Almonds. Almonds have a lot of vitamin E and some calcium. Vitamin E has been shown to be helpful in Parkinson's disease, but we know from this Harvard study that it's not vitamin E from taking a vitamin E supplement. Um, you have to get it from real food. And that's what I tell patients all the time. Get your vitamins from real food. They did this study where they looked at patients who took, who got vitamin E supplements, pills. Um, they, they had vitamin E rich foods like almonds, and then they took nothing. And at the end of the study, those who had vitamin E rich foods had a reduced risk of Parkinson's compared to both nothing and vitamin E supplements. So again, get it from real food. Pistachios, I love pistachios. I just had some today. They're great for your eyes. They have lutein and B6, which is good for your nerves in small amounts. And of course, when you buy these nuts, you want them raw or without all the oils. You do not want Cajun spice or Thai chili uh, sauce because these are all extra calories and the nuts themselves are already high in calorie. Um, one quarter cup is about what I recommend every day, but one quarter cup of walnuts is about 200 calories already. Pistachios is the skinny nut, so it's about 160 to 180 calories. But you know, when I first uh, found out about walnuts and omega fatty acids, I was eating handfuls all throughout the day. I had this big bag in my office. And then after a few months, I called my dry cleaner and I was like, you shrunk all my pants. And then I realized, nope, that was the walnuts. All my pants were shrunk. So now I eat pistachios. But anyway, so very be, be very, very careful about how much you're eating. All right. And next slide. Oh, we're having a little bit of delay here. Oops, sorry. 
Okay. Okay, the next recommendation that I make is going gluten free. Gluten is a protein that's found in wheat that we think may be pro-inflammatory, meaning it may stimulate your autoimmune disease, which is the last thing that sarcoidosis patients want, right? Um, so gluten, uh, like I said, it's, it's a wheat protein that's found in pasta and, and cakes and cookies. Yes, there is gluten-free pasta, there is gluten-free pretzels, gluten-free cereal, it tastes like cardboard, and it costs three times the amount of regular food. However, you can still gain weight. So for my patients who are trying to lose weight, uh, especially if you have to be on steroids, when I say gluten-free, I do not mean gluten-free cookies or gluten-free pretzels. I mean no carbs, no pasta, no cake. Um, if you absolutely love pasta, then you can use spaghetti squash. Uh, and and uh, it's just this great big yellow thing. It looks like a blimp. And then you warm it and it just scrapes off into noodles and you can put spaghetti sauce over it. Um, brown rice, if you need uh, to have some rice. Quinoa, it looks like quinoa, but quinoa is a South American grain, has six grams of protein in it, um, very power packed. Here's a picture of, uh, for those of you who know about Ethiopian food, this is injera bread and it's made of teff, which is also uh, gluten-free and buckwheat. I'm not so crazy about buckwheat pancakes, but they are gluten-free. Again, if you wanna lose weight, I would cut all of this. And what I tell my patients, and this is my uh, diet mainly, get protein, that's your friend, chicken, fish, lean cuts of red meat if you have to have it, fruits, vegetables, nuts, that's it. That's what I eat. Do you have to cut dairy? No, but that's something that you can consider, especially if you're trying to cut weight, cut cheese, things like that. The next thing is dark chocolate, okay? Dark chocolate may be uh, good for you in terms of opening up the blood vessels in your brain. So it may help reduce the risk of stroke, um, heart disease, and even dementia. And they contain these components called flavanols. Now remember I said dark chocolate, not milk chocolate, and it's not unlimited. So the amount of dark chocolate they recommend is about one to two ounces, which is well, one lint, lint uh, truffle ball is about 0.8 to one ounce. That's it. And you want dark chocolate, not milk chocolate. Uh, because again, it's it's in the cacao. Or I don't know how to pronounce it, cacao, whatever. All right. And so then uh, Kuna Indians is uh, a group of uh, Native Americans in uh, Central America. And they have this cocoa, this dark chocolate cocoa that they drink, and they have almost zero heart disease. So it is good for you, but in moderation. All right, next is uh, vitamin B12. I know this isn't an actual thing, but vitamin B12 is one of the most important things that you need in your diet. And the reason why it's so important is because you need it for your brain, your spinal cords, your eyes, um, it's one of the first things we check for patients who have memory loss. And in our patients who have neuropathy uh, related to sarcoidosis, almost 15 to 20% will have a B12 deficiency. We, we looked at a, a clinical trial about 150 patients. And what happens is um, B12, it's only found in animal products. So if you're a vegetarian, you do need to supplement. Uh, so patients who are vegan or vegetarian will be more prone to B12 deficiency. But the other two instances where you get B12 deficiency is that's very common is if you take PPIs or acid blockers like Protonix, Prilosec, um, all of these drugs that help prevent acid from the steroids or other medications you may be on. You need acid to absorb the B12. So when you block the acid, you're not getting it. And I tell my patients, I could give you a truckload of B12 to swallow, it's not gonna be absorbed. The other issue is if you have steroid induced diabetes or diabetes and you have to take a medication called metformin, that also blocks the absorption of B12. So you do need it. When you go to your doctor, don't just have your B12 level checked. You also want these two markers. It's called methylmalonic acid and homocysteine. These are related to the B12. And those are more sensitive markers. Finally, how do you give it? I usually give injections, they're pretty cheap. It, even if your insurance doesn't cover it, I buy it for my mother, it's $20 for everything, the syringes and everything. Uh, and there's a YouTube link that you can look at on how to give it to yourself. But uh, the other thing, if you're squeamish about needles, you can take it under the tongue. It's 2,500 mics of B12 a day, micrograms, or B12 injections, and it's 1,000 micrograms 
once a month or more, depending on how low your level is. Okay. And then the other thing here, some general recommendations about nutrition, uh, especially if you're on um, things like methotrexate, is it thioprine, all these drugs that can affect your immune system um, and you have liver issues, I would cut the alcohol. You don't have to stop it completely. I would, if you could, especially if nerve or brain or spinal cord diseases, I would just cut it if you can. Definitely cut sugar. Um, if you can't pronounce it, don't buy it. Start looking at your labels. That's an important thing. Uh, another one is eat what you can digest. So a lot of people, you know, will try to eat healthy and they hear, oh, kale's good for you, cauliflower. And I was doing that. I was eating tons of kale and cauliflower. And then I looked down and my stomach is bloated out to here. For those of our patients who have autonomic dysfunction, you will have bloating as well. And you look down and your stomach's this thick. You're like, oh man, I could have had the same effect with chocolate cake, right? So uh, just eat what you can digest. And these things are called, uh, some of them are like cauliflower and broccoli. Those are cruciferous vegetables. Um, some people just don't break them down as well. And then the last thing is local versus organic. Um, yes, uh, it's better if you can get organic, but I'm not going to pay $5 a pound for apples. I'm an academic neurologist, not private practice. Uh, but yes, there are pesticides. And uh, one of the big ones that made the news a few years ago is neonicotinoids, which is what they thought were killing bees. The problem with neonicotinoids are they're powerful pesticides. You know, you think you wash it, you can use vinegar and salt, use all these sprays, you can try to get off the pesticide. These are in the seeds, which means the entire fruit has a uh, pesticide in it. So if you can go to organic, I said, I would say try, especially for the berries, but otherwise just eat local um, and it is what it is. But here is a reason why not to eat um, uh, things that have pesticides. So this is one of my favorite slides. I, I saw this in a meeting many, many years ago. You can see here, um, there was this study at, in Mexico looking at the, the Joaquin Valley. And there were two agricultural groups, one in the foothills and one in the valley. And both of them grew crops and they sold them. And the, the people in the valley said, you know what, we want to increase, increase our yield. So we're going to use pesticides. And so they did for many years. And what this scientist did, they, he went, she went in there and she asked these three to five year olds to draw pictures of kids. They look normal. They both, in both groups, they were developmentally fine. They could run and play. But this is how the kids in the foothills drew the pictures of a person. You can see there's a mouth, a nose, hand, arms. This is how the kids in the valley who took the pesticides, who, who grew uh, fruits and vegetables and, and crops with pesticides, Look at that, it doesn't look like anything. So it did affect hand-eye coordination and some cognition. Uh, we just don't know enough about what it does to adults. All right. um, although there have been some links, even with sarcoidosis, that pesticides can do something. All right, the next major recommendation is exercise. For many of my patients, this is their saving grace. I have this labor lawyer who has a neuropathy and uh, it's very painful. And so what he does is he puts capsaicin on his hands and then he goes weightlifting, he puts on gloves and he'll go weightlifting and he says, I love to feel the burn. Uh, but this is what takes your mind off the neuropathy. This is what can take your mind off the sarcoidosis and it makes you feel better. And it might release some helpful chemicals, neurotransmitters and hormones that could help you uh, do well overall. Now, this is the four rules of exercise. This was uh, created by Matt Sutliff. Setliff. He was the head of physical therapy for neuropatients at the Cleveland Clinic, and I think he still is. He made this up. This is fantastic. A lot of my surgery friends uh, lo love this. The number one rule, this isn't the most, this is not my favorite rule, but the number one rule is pick something you can like, you like or you can tolerate. Because as we know, what's the number one month that everybody joins a gym? January. And what's the number one month that everybody quits the gym? February, because you have to like it, right? So I don't care what you do, Zumba, jazzercise, you gotta do something, okay? The second one is the most important rule. And this is the two hour rule. I tell all my patients this, um, my surgeons, friends tell their patients this after they have surgery. And the two hour rule is this. Let's say you do something like the elliptical or the treadmill, 20, 30 minutes. Two hours later, you should feel neutral or refreshed. If you feel tired or worse, that was too much. You need to stop and readjust. The only person who's gonna be able to know is you. So really pay attention to how you feel at two hours. 
Number three, got to do something every day. I don't care if it's just walking to your mailbox to get the mail or walking around your house, do something every day. And finally, for my SARC patients, for my neuro patients, no pain, no gain does not apply. Do not push yourself because you will pay for it. Okay. Um, the second thing about exercise is for those of you who are trying to lose weight, um, the best recommendation is what we use for patients with metabolic syndrome, which is pre-diabetes with um, increased cholesterol and being overweight and uh, things like that. But the recommendation that's out there is you try to do 150 minutes of exercise a week. You can make it in any variation you want to. You can do you know, 30 minutes five times a week, 50 minutes three times a week, however you want, but 150 minutes a week is going to help you lose weight. Um, well, what can I do? That's what a lot of patients say. I can't do anything. I'm too tired. Um, aqua therapy is great for, especially my patients who have neuropathy or my older patients just getting in the pool. You know, I did this with senior citizens. I got into a pool at the senior center and we, uh, they gave us these little floaty things, these, these floaty noodles, and they played fifties uh, music and they were just dancing in the deep water. So you've got the noodle and then your legs are doing this um, and, and this and all these different things. And it's a great workout. I mean, they were singing and having a great time. And I was like, oh, are we done yet? But it's a really good workout. Um, recumbent bicycle, these are for patients who have balance issues. So the, these are the bicycles that are very low on the ground and there's very risk, low risk of getting hurt. You just kind of roll out. You're not going to fall. A rowing machine for patients who have dizziness because you're just sitting still. This is more involved. It's a great workout, but make sure you learn how to do it um, uh, properly. Walking. Uh, this is probably the easiest thing. Just put on some tennis shoes and go and walk outside. Don't walk with an iPhone or iPad or uh, phone, what do you call it? iPods in your ear. Don't walk with a friend. Don't walk with your dog walk by yourself, because then that's going to be a kind of meditation for you too. And now there's a new thing called a recumbent elliptical, where you can just do it at your desk or do it in a chair, and that can supposedly give you a good workout too. All right, last but not least is supplements. Um, I'm, again, not crazy about this, but for my patients with neuropathy or any kind of pain, it hurts and they want a pill and they want something fast. So aside from all the medications that make you fat and goofy, uh, these are some natural things that uh, my patients have told me over the years have helped them. And there's some literature, acetyl L-carnitine has the most literature and that's a thousand milligrams three times daily. It's been used in chemo related neuropathy, HIV and diabetic related neuropathy. Glutamine, I've used in my patients with breast cancer. Um, I know Seattle Cancer Care, Sloan Kettering, uh, and uh, I think something in Boston, they, MD Anderson, I think. Um, anyway, uh, MD Anderson in Houston, and then something in Boston or New York, I can't remember, but they use glutamine for patients who are about to undergo chemotherapy. It might be neuroprotective. Alpha lipoic acid, Maybe it, it helps. We know that the IV version helps. Uh, the German study showed a great result, but the problem is the German Blue Cross Blue Shield, whatever they have, the insurance company, they don't pay for IV, they pay for oral. So they just said, well, let's just do oral. So it might help, it might not. Uh, Vicks Vapor Rub, um, I have a 70 year old, uh, his girlfriend puts it on his feet and he said, I, it makes it feel so soft and nice. Horse liniment cream, um, you can get this at an Amish store, you can get this online at $6. It's what they use on race horses. Tiger Bomb, Juice Plus, I don't have any stock in this, but I had six patients over a period of three to four months come from all over the country who told me that they swear by this. It's so popular. Costco has an equivalent called Juice Festive, it's $17 a month. Curcumin is, you need a compounding pharmacy that is an antioxidant. Frankincense, not gold not burr, frankincense. Uh, it's actually a thing. Uh, they did a, a mouse study and they found that frankincense helps with uh, diabetic mouse, uh, who, diabetic mice with neuropathy and then hemp cream can help as well. Okay. Um, and the last uh, out of the supplements is medical marijuana. So I came from the uh, Cleveland, which is a very big Bible thumping state. You know, we didn't even talk about marijuana until, uh, just a few years ago, to Chicago, where everybody and their brother wants to know about marijuana. I have a 92-year-old who loves the uh, marijuana, the CBD oils, because it on her feet. 
But medical marijuana has helped a lot of our patients. It's a game changer for my patients with neuropathy. It can help you sleep as well. I have my own personal beliefs about uh, medical marijuana uh, and or marijuana in general, and, and, and it's a gateway drug, but it really does help my patients. And I'm, I'm happy to talk about it with them. Never, ever, ever smoke or inhale it vape it, uh, especially if you've got sarcoidosis, but we just don't know the long-term effects. So the best type of medical marijuana is for my patients is the gummies. Um, you can also do the CBD oil or the tinctures under your tongue. Um, don't do the baked goods because the things get dispersed throughout the brownie and you don't know how much you're really getting. Chocolates are okay too. Uh, I have one patient who does the gummy octopus and uh, he eats one leg at a time. And when the pain's really bad, he'll bite off the head. But here's the problem. So they have CBD and THC. They have over a hundred different components. The CBD is the, the one that most people know. And it, you have CBD receptors on your nerves. So it actually does something on a, on a physical level rather than just play Jedi mind tricks that, oh, you don't really have pain. Like things like gabapentin and pregabalin, also there's Lyrica, they just dull you. But these really do do something at the level of the nerve. But here's the problem. You can't do a really good clinical trial where you blind one half of the study. I mean, how do you blind marijuana? They know. Uh, it also causes cognitive impairment. They did this study where these, this group of patients were smoking marijuana and they did great for pain, but they flunked all the cognitive testing. Uh, and then finally, it's still illegal, meaning medical marijuana with a prescription, and, and that's, I'm sorry, Recreational marijuana is still illegal. Medical marijuana is legal, but it's not federally mandated. So no matter what state you're in, even if you're in Colorado, medical marijuana, you can be fired for it by your employer um, if they see it in your urine. So you've got to be careful. Okay. Next in uh, my favorite thing to talk about is, and I'm sorry that my slides are so wonky today, um, mindfulness mind-body therapies. We are inundated by advertisements and people and, and, and commercials and emails telling us we need to be more mindful. But what does that really mean? What is mindfulness? And I think that the best definition of mindfulness I ever heard was from one of my patients who told me he died. And what had happened was um, we'd been doing an EMG and we were just chatting during the EMG. And he said, you know, uh, doc, you know, I died last year, don't you? And I said, I'm sorry. And he goes, yeah, I died. And what happened was he had been playing tennis with a friend of his. He was an executive and he was playing tennis at this country club with his friend. Uh, after they finished, the friend went home. He walked into the country club and he just dropped down onto the ground. Fortunately for him, the woman who walked in behind him was a nurse who had been playing on the court next to him. She and the attendant immediately grabbed the defibrillator off the wall. It had a heart attack. Um, she brought him back, they felt a pulse, and he got life flighted to the nearest hospital. Uh, he got a stent, emergently put in, and then he woke up four days later. And he says he doesn't remember anything except for one thing. And he said he saw a light. And he said, really, you saw a light? Because you hear that all the time. He goes, no, no, not like that. It's not that kind of light. It was this beautiful blue green light. And what he remembers is, this sensation of ascending, like going up. And he said there was this sense of a place. And he could look down, he saw the tops of houses. He couldn't make out any other details, just the top of houses. And it was just this beautiful blue green light and he felt peaceful. And then he woke up and I was like, wow. I said, did it change your life? Do you enjoy every moment? He goes, yes, I appreciate every moment. And I was like, really? You enjoy every moment. You enjoy being in line at the grocery store. You love standing in line at the post office. I was like, no, I don't love it, but I don't mind it. And that's the key. You don't mind it. You're not filling your head with things like, oh my God, you know, do you know where I have to be in just a few minutes? Or I have so many things to do. I can't, I can't believe this woman's trying to pay for this with a check. And, and you know what? It's just drama. You're creating all this drama with your thoughts. And that's what we do. We get in our head. We create one thought after another. And that's what mindfulness does. It gets us out of our thoughts. And one of the kind of mind-body therapies I talk about 
The first is mindfulness. And what that is, is non-judgmental awareness of the present moment. Just like that guy was saying, he was there, he was standing in line, he's just standing in line. That's it. There's nothing added to that. And you're just like, okay, I'm standing in line. You don't think about how upset you are. You don't think about how annoyed you are. It just is what it is. There's concentration meditation, where when you um, focus all of your attention on your breathing, you can just count your breathing. If that's uh, if you can't keep your um, mind there, you just count your breathing. In, one, out, one. In, two, out, two. And it's just keeping your mind right there. And then finally, movement meditation, which is very popular here in the US and overseas. Uh, there's yoga, there's Tai Chi, uh, which is a type of Chinese um, martial art. You've seen these, these women, these nine-year-old women in Hong Kong doing, you know, cloud hands in the park. But if you do it quickly, it's actually a martial art. It's a defense move. Qigong, it looks like Q-I-G-O-N-G, but it's Qigong. And this is a Chinese uh, meditation exercise. But the, 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 the issue is all of these things get you out of your head. And that's what we need to do. Um, one of the best examples of, um, um, I'm so sorry, medit uh, what happens when we get into our head is was given by psychologists and it's about, so guy asks a girl out, girl says no. What does a guy usually say? Well, you're missing all this, right? It's your loss. No, I'm kidding. But uh, really um, a patient with depression, that is where people really get stuck in their head, depression. And so people, a guy who asks a girl out who has depression, girl says no, the guy will think, oh my gosh, I'm so ugly. She doesn't like me. No one's ever gonna like me. I'm never gonna find anyone. I'm gonna be alone forever. Over and over and over, you send these false brain messages so that you believe that it's real. But the issue is these are just thoughts. Thoughts are not necessarily real. We make them real. And so what they do is with meditation and mindfulness, you recognize, you know, when you think, oh my gosh, no one's ever going to love me. Then you think, nope, that's a false brain message. And you stop it right there instead of letting it go on and on and on. And I see this in my patients with sarcoidosis and other neurologic diseases. You ask, why me? Why do I have to deal with this? You know, I've been a pretty good person and it's not fair. And then on and on and on, and you've got to stop. It is what it is. We're going to deal with it. You're going to get better and you just got to move on. All right. And so what are the effects of meditation on the body? It can help you with diabetes. We are seeing more and more data that says it can help with brain mass and uh, uh, memory loss. Uh, it can prevent memory loss. It can help you live longer. It can help you with urinary incontinence, and there are some studies that show they can help with heart failure, at least the symptoms of heart failure. Uh, I've seen it help with patients with emphysema and difficulty breathing. And we've done our own studies. It can help with multiple sclerosis and neuropathy. Um, but also, what can it do for the mind? And this is very important, if not just important or more important than what it does do for the body. It can definitely reduce stress and depression. Depression. It reduces your relapse rate of depression because it gets you out of that negative cycle in your head. It can reduce anxiety just by breathing, deep breathing. You can snap yourself out of it and it improves overall mood disturbances. And these are all very, very common in patients with uh, sarcoidosis. Oops, I, again, I apologize. And how do you meditate? Uh, not like this. You don't suppress yourself and say, no thoughts, no thoughts, no thoughts. Um, here are some easy techniques that you can do for everyday mindfulness. Um, the first one is a sitting practice. And what you do is, as you're just sitting, just sit. You do not have to sit on the floor and torture yourself in an Indian style. You just sit on a couch, right? Something comfortable, but quiet by yourself. And then you just focus and you just see what comes in your head. And a thought comes, you focus on the thought, you see it as your thought, See it just as a thought and then let it go and then come back to your focus. What's next? What's next on the docket? Okay. And you can focus on your breath. So it gives you something to focus on. But again, when you see something come up, see it as a thought and come back. When you're driving, okay, you can do mindfulness in the car. And this is a, a, a technique that was taught by a meditation master many, many years ago. He's from Thailand. He taught to people from all over the world. And he did it for cancer patients too. And it's five deep breaths. You just do it like this five times in a row. 
And when you're in a car and someone cuts you off and you're in rush hour traffic and you're late so, and you're about to give them a lovely finger gesture, just take five deep breaths right there and it just resets you just for a moment. Mindfulness with walking. This is what I was telling you about earlier. No iPod, no iPhone, no friend. Just walk by yourself, walk quickly. Let things come and go because that is how you're gonna extrapolate to your thoughts. You let things just come and go and you just walk very quickly. And then finally, mindfulness at your desk. If you're still working um, and you have these thoughts in your head, you're, you're staring at the computer, you're like, oh my God, I'm never gonna get this done. You have this long, huge email inbox. What you do is you just look out the window, okay? If you don't look at have a window, just look at the corner of your room. What you need to do is just shift your gaze from where you are right now. That shift in your gaze is gonna break your thoughts just for a moment, but it's enough that you can just get out of it and then restart yourself. Think of it as your own personal control, alt delete. Okay, and where can you learn more about this? Certainly there are community classes. I know that right now with COVID it's, it's tough, but there are all these online things that you can try. Um, I took Tai Chi at, a, um, a, at the local community center when I was in Cleveland. And uh, you know I took Tai Chi there and I had this one guy, he's the CEO, some company he had a disease like neurosarcoidosis of his brain it wasn't neurosarc but he had to quit for a while and i said you know why don't you do tai chi why don't you get out of here he was like no i'm the ceo i go skiing i do all that i was like just try just try the 24 short form it's called the yang style 24 short form that's what i do and it's just try it he's like nah nah i'm not gonna do it and he's this big macho guy i saw him in follow-up a few months later, he teaches the 108 long form Tai Chi. So there are so many things you can do in the community. Um, books, uh, there are some great books out there by Jack Cornfield, John Kabat-Zinn, um, and in a former talk, uh, one of my colleagues had mentioned that I had written this book about nutrition, exercise, mind-body therapies in uh, plastic suffering. And then there are some mindfulness-based stress reduction courses. Uh, these are expensive, they're pretty intense. Um, but meditation retreats, there are some all over the country. Some of them are free, some of them are expensive. It's usually a 10 day retreat, but I went to a bunch of them, the free ones when I was young and they're great. Um, just something to get you started. All right, and that's it. Uh, I hope uh, that you benefited from this and I'm gonna be around for the next half hour to answer questions. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Tavi. Um, that was awesome. <laughs> so we do have actually a couple questions. Um, I don't know if you want to go ahead and um, if you want to keep your share up or not, but it's up to you. Um, but we do have a couple questions. So I'm going to start off uh, with those for you. So our first question um, is, are there any medications you can take to stop uh, or to sort of help counteract the weight gain if you've already tried everything that you mentioned in the slides? Yes, so this is a prescription medication and um, I will give this to patients with neuropathy uh, as well as headaches. It's a great headache preventive. It's called topiramate, also known as Topamax. We also call it Dopamax because it can make you sleepy. But Topamax is, it was initially used as a seizure drug um, and they, it, it was in little kids and it even comes in, in addition to pills, it comes in as sprinkles, okay? Like cupcake sprinkles. And what happened was it stopped the seizures, but the little kids stopped eating. You do not that want that in a child. In a middle-aged person who's trying to lose weight, yes, that's something you could do. So for, for my patients with um, weight gain and headaches and neuropathy, I will give them Topamax. And it's actually being used in a clinical trial right now. It was part of that in Northwestern, looking at um, pre-diabetes and neuropathy. And they would give patients Topamax because it is half of a diet drug that people are taking. It's a prescription drug. Topamax is uh, 25 milligrams and 100 milligrams. And I, what I do is I titrate 25 every night for a week, then 50, then 75, think of them as quarters and dollars, then switch them to the 100 milligram pill. Um, there are side effects. As I said, it makes you dopey, so you take it at night. Um, there's a one in 300,000 chance of causing glaucoma. If you have depression, it can make it a little bit worse. So you'd have to talk to your friends, make sure everybody knows I'm taking this drug. And if you start saying funny things and, and you're really sad, then you have to come off of it. But otherwise it's a relatively well tolerated drug. Uh, oh, and then kidney stones. So drink lots of water with it. But it's, it's, I've given it to a lot of patients. And a friend of mine is a headache doctor 
she took it for herself because she wanted to lose weight. She had migraines, but I had one patient who, um, he was a man and uh, I put him on this diet and he did the Tobamax and he lost 40 pounds. I had this one woman who had severe diabetic neuropathy. She was over 300 pounds. I put her on Topamax. I put her on um, the diet, chicken, fish, fruits, vegetables, nuts, that's it. Six months later, she came back. She was like, Dr. Tavi, I lost 90 pounds. I lost you. Um, but no, I'm way over 90 pounds, but thank you. But yeah, so it does work. Sorry, I was on mute there. Thank you. Um, so the next question we have is, are, um, are there any sweeteners that are okay? Um, monk fruit extract or stevia? So monk fruit extract is, is, I think it's okay. I haven't read anything. I did stevia. Everyone says, oh, it's natural. It's great. Um, I did read one article. So I don't know how good this is that it might cause um, hormonal imbalances in animal studies. So I don't know how safe it is. I just know it's really bad for baking. <laughs> it does not taste good. But if you're gonna have sugar, I would just do honey, especially locally grown honey, because it's, it's gonna uh, build up your immune system. I know it's controversial, but it's something to think about. And then just try, um, if you need sugar, then uh, like if you're gonna do a smoothie, I'll put in a couple of red grapes, you know, just to get that sweet, that sweetness. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a question a little bit about COVID. So with COVID cases picking up and immunocompromised patients being in the high risk category, even if vaccinated, what food supplement or supplements could you use to boost up your intake to minimize your risk of being uh, or having a breakthrough case? Protein, protein, protein is your friend. Um, you've got to keep your protein up. And I, like you said, fruits and vegetables. And the funny thing is in, in a, my, one of my former bosses, actually got COVID. Uh, he was a physician researcher and he said, oh, Jenny, Jewish chicken soup. You gotta have the chicken matzo ball soup. And I had an electrician come to my house and he had COVID and he said, the thing that got me through, he was an Irishman and he's like, it was chicken soup. I can't do the brogue, but it was, it was chicken soup. So there's something about the protein. There's something about chicken that can um, be that, that, I mean, everybody knows that, right? Chicken noodle soup. But uh, protein and then fruits and vegetables, that's what I would recommend. There's one thing I would recommend against, and that is echinacea. This is an herb that's been seen in things like airborne and a lot of immune stimulants um, to protect you from uh, colds and things. The problem is, and one of my friends uh, who was an MS specialist actually told me this, the last thing you guys want is to stimulate your immune system. Right, and so echinacea stimulates your immune system. So I do try to uh, tell my patients to stay away from this, but just a good healthy diet. Again, chicken, fish, lean cuts of red meat, protein, 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 and, and B12, supplement with B12. Thank you. Um, and just a reminder, so we are getting a couple of questions. This is a housekeeping question, um, but uh, we will be sending out the recording of this video. And um, I, Dr. Tavi, um, I think he has already supplied the slides to me, but if you haven't, go ahead and send them in long and we'll put them out in a PDF format for people to have um, because it does have lots of great information on it. Um, so hopefully that answers those questions for those few of you. Um, so we have another question. We actually have two questions on this about uh, naltrexone um, and whether or not um, it is good or what your opinions on it are. Um, as either an anti-inflammatory or treatment for fatigue? So I've had a number of patients, I personally have never prescribed it. I haven't seen anything bad about it. Um, I think it seems to be safe. There's not a lot of data yet, especially in the neurosarcoidosis population or the sarcoidosis population. But uh, I have a few patients who are titrating up on it now. They think it might help them. So if you have a physician who's experienced in giving this, um, it might be worth a try. Thank you. Oh my gosh, we have so many questions. <laughs> okay, guys. <laughs> That's okay. Um, awesome. That's okay. <laughs> um, so this is a really big question, um, but and we get this. But there's several people who've asked this question, and and it's also come through the chat, is including uh, the Q and A part. But what's the best way to fight fatigue? And just so you guys know, we have an entire webinar on this later in the year. But uh, Dr. Tavi, if you have a, a short story answer for how to fight fatigue. 
Um, Ritalin has the best um, data in the sarcoidosis population. They've done a number of clinical trials. I know Bob Bachman and his wife, Elise Lower, have done a lot of trials. Um, I usually do low doses, five to 10 milligrams. And I do, I've done this, uh, the highest I've ever given it, and I'm not comfortable doing this, is 20. But you usually take about, a usual dose is about five to 10 in the morning when you get up. And then you can take another one at noon, but don't take it after noon because then, you know, at 10 o'clock, you're like, hey, what's going on, guys? But um, that's that's probably the one uh, that I know about the most in the stock population. Um, we've been doing for our post-COVID patients, we see a ton. We've seen almost 3,000 post-COVID patients here at National Jewish. So fatigue is huge in this population. Um, there's something called amantadine that's been used in multiple sclerosis for many years. It's okay. It's okay. And it's cheap. Um, it can make you have palpitations. We haven't had a really big success in the uh, post-COVID group, but in the um, MS group, it may help. And then of course there's a uh, provigil, which is also known as modafinil. And that has good literature in, in the multiple sclerosis population. Although some studies say it works like a charm. Other studies say it doesn't work at all. It is approved for shift workers. The generic is out, which is modafinil, and it's much cheaper than the provigil. It used to be very cost prohibitive. But those are probably the three that I know of the most. Of course, coffee, I mean, you don't really want to be addicted to coffee, but that's an easy way of doing it. And then sleeping well. Unfortunately, patients with sarcoidosis, um, you have, you're on steroids, you have insomnia, or you have other things that can cause insomnia. Uh, and then you get into this vicious cycle of insomnia and fatigue. So that's why I think that exercise, changing your diet really makes a difference. I used to eat junk food all the time. I mean, I ate... Um, uh, spicy Cheetos for dinner as when I was a fellow, I was horrible. Now I am very healthy. But when I changed my diet, that made a huge difference in my energy level. And if you only did one thing, if you came from this talk and you only do one thing, cut gluten. That would be the number one thing that I recommend. Cut your carbs. Don't go keto. Keto is not good for you um, as a SARC patient, um, but it, it's just too crazy. Just do, just cut gluten and cut carbs and you will lose weight. I don't know why, but my male patients just drop weight like that. The women are like snarl at their husband, like that's not fair, but you will lose weight too. Just if that's the one thing you can do and losing weight, eating right will improve your energy level. Thank you. Um, so this is another great question. Um, uh, one of our attendees is uh, confused about immune support. If my immune system is overactive, is it bad to have foods that boost my immune system? So your immune system is, pardon my medical term, wonky, okay? It works when it's not supposed to, and it doesn't work when it's supposed to. So these are natural ways to build up just your, your support, your immune system. You're not artificially stimulating it. You're just building it. You're building good antibodies. So it's, well, I, I can't say that for sure. I mean, there's no literature, but you're just so building a supportive immune network. Um, and you'll see when patients aren't eating well, when they're not sleeping well, that's when they're going to get infections. That's when they're going to be most predisposed to uh, pneumonia and things like that. So um, keeping your body as healthy as possible is going to be your best fight against sarcoidosis. Thank you. We actually have two questions about elderberry. Um, they're not very specific. Um, I think they're asking about whether or not elderberry is okay for you and whether or not um, elderberry syrup uh, should be avoided. Gosh, I, I don't know. That's a great question. I don't know much about elderberry. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so we have a, another question um, about um, sort of the mind-body stuff here. So um, could hypnosis be considered a form of meditation? No, because that's being done to you, right? You're not controlling your, your mind. The whole point of mindfulness is to control your mind, control your thoughts, and understand that these are just false brain messages. They are not real. It's like text messages, right? That you get that are from the wrong person. You can just delete it and block them. You can control that. And that's why meditation is good. It gets you out of your head. Thank you. Okay, guys, so sorry. And some of these questions are really long. And I just wanna note that if your questions are super, super specific, we might not be able to get to them because we only have um, a, you know about 10 more minutes left. So if your 
questions are a little more broad, that's that's super helpful to get us um, through them. So um, we do have a question about, are there, um, are there some things that people can have if they have hypercalcemia? Um, what do you mean, like foods or? I think foods. Uh, Joni, if you're able to uh, specify that, that would be a little helpful. So the question was some things I can't have due to, oh, some things that she shouldn't have due to hypercalcemia. Are there some- Oh, yes. Have? So you have to be careful. So hypercalcemia in, in sarcoidosis, one of the worst things it can do is it can cause kidney function damage, right? Because too much of it, I mean, and this is simplifying it, clogs up your kidney. So you do have to talk to your kidney doctor and, and make sure that um, you don't need to be on a protein restriction diet, things like that. Uh, if you just have a normal amount of food, it should be fine, but uh, you might wanna to talk to your doctor. So pineapple has calcium, almonds have calcium, obviously milk and all these other med uh, uh, dairy products have fortified calcium. But again, if you just, drink and eat things in moderation, it should be okay. But if it's too high and you already have um, an impaired kidney function, then I would talk to your kidney doctor. But otherwise, if it's just mild hypercalcemia, I would not worry about it. Um, well, since we're on the kidneys, we do have a question about, can someone eat too much protein? They're concerned about overtaxing their kidneys. Well, yes, and, and that's what I'm saying. You know, If you have uh, impaired renal function already, there, you may have a protein restriction. So you, I would talk to your kidney doctor. They used, we used to use something called creatinine is the protein to monitor your kidney function. But the biggest thing now is something called GFR or glomerular filtration rate. And that's what they use to measure how good your kidney function is. So, you know, I, I think a lot of patients are getting their labs now back through their electronic health record system. So you can see look at GFR to see if your kidney function is okay. And they'll have like a normal value or a flag value. If it looks good, then you're good to go. You can eat what you need to eat that's healthy. Thank you. Um, we have another question about, have you seen data related to sarcoidosis and blood clotting? No, I have not. I'm sorry. <laughs> that, that's out of my realm of expertise, but I would imagine that um, some uh, patients who do have sarcoidosis, especially who have uh, blood issues, may be at risk. Uh, and certainly if you are not active as much, you may be at risk as well. Awesome. Well, I have, an easy, I, I have a presumably an easier question for you. Are dark cherries good for you? Dark cherries? Um, I don't know. Are you talking about the Michigan cherries? I'm getting like dark red cherries or like the the darker ones, not the yellowy red ones. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I would think that if it's darker red and it's, you know, not artificially darker red, then yeah, because as I said before, it's in the uh, pigment. So darker colored, brighter colored um, uh, fruits are good for you. And I know that the Michigan, they, they do have these I don't know, they're black cherries, right? Is that what you guys are talking about? I'm not sure. It, it's, it's good for you. It's all good for you in moderation because those are very high in, they, some of them can be, especially the rainier cherries, they can be high in uh, sugar as well. Yeah, they're tasty though. Yes. Um, so we actually have a big, this sort of uh, an elephant in the room question around vitamin D. Um, so if you're vitamin D deficient, should you add supplements to your diet? That's, that's a big question for a lot of the SARC uh, physicians, uh, the pulmonologists, they, they manage this. But what I've been told, and this I'm not an expert on this, but what I've been told is that you want to look at the vitamin D, D2 level, split it up into D3 and D2. And the reason why is because um, they found that they do, the granulomas do secrete vitamin D. So you've got to be careful. And that's why a lot of people will have hyper uh, elevated levels and you have to be super careful about supplementing them. But vitamin D is what, D2 is what the uh, stock specialists will give their patients depending on what their D2 level is. So make sure that when you get your vitamin D levels checked, make sure that's fractionated out into D2 versus D3. Great. So we have a question about, um, if someone has osteopenia, their doctor's pushing dairy, but you know, your talk suggested less dairy or cutting dairy. So what would, what would you say in that case for folks that are dealing with that? Then I would, I mean, if that's the best source of uh, 
um, calcium and, and, and vitamin D for you in a natural way, then do yogurts. That's going to be good for your um, gut biome. Um, Cow milk, you just got to be careful. You know, we have so much hormones and, and these, these artificial things in our foods now. But I think that they do have some milks that can have, that have fortification of calcium and, and vitamin D that are oat milk, um, almond milk, things like that. So look for those things. But, you know, I'm just saying that from a, a weight loss point of view, and it might be pro-inflammatory, we're not sure. So uh, I would weigh weigh the, the risks and benefits, but, you know, maybe just some yogurt would be okay. Thank you. And this um, is my personal opinion. Oh, I wanted to say one more thing about vitamin D. Be careful. Now, um, a lot of the vitamin D studies where we know about the side effects of having low vitamin D are based on Caucasians. We now know that patients who are African-American, Asian, and Hispanic, we have pigment in our skins. And that, um, alters the way our vitamin D levels are measured. So they did the study where they looked at patients who had low vitamin D who were African-American or Hispanic. And they found that even though they had low vitamin D levels, their um, bone densities were normal. So just a, a, a word, I, I don't know who asked that, but um, just because your vitamin D level is low doesn't mean it necessarily isn't, you don't have enough. Thank you. Um, we also have a question about nightshades and other foods that cause inflammation. Should people with sarcoidosis avoid tomatoes and other nightshade family? Yes, I've seen that. I've seen all these diets where you avoid that. I would say it's tough, right? You, you got to eat. And if you're too picky with your food, you're not going to stick with the diet. So if you want to do it, you can. I, don't, I haven't seen any literature with that. I haven't seen any patients tell me, oh my gosh, avoid night. That's not true. I've had a few patients tell me that avoiding nightshades did help with their autoimmune neuropathy. But for my SARC patients, like I said, if you can just cut gluten and just stick to fish, chicken, protein, fruits, vegetables, nuts, that's good enough. It's good enough. Awesome. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm going through these. We um, have another question about um, uh, have you heard, this is about the mind body stuff. Have you heard of the online free MBSR program called Palouse Mindfulness? And is it legitimate? If you've heard of it. Oh, A, I've never heard of it. But um, B, MBSR, it, it was started by John Cabot Zinn, Z-I-N-N. -N. And so if they follow his protocol and they follow his book, which is called Full Catastrophe Living, he's a huge, I think he's a psychologist or neuropsychologist, maybe just a psychologist who started the entire movement. If they follow his protocol, then I would think it's legitimate, but you can also call the NBSR Society or the John Kabat-Zinn folks and see if that's a real thing. Thank you. Um, so we have just a couple minutes left, guys. I'm gonna try to get through this. We have still quite a lot of questions. Um, so uh, one question is, are there other helpful proteins that are not animal proteins? Sure, so there's pea protein. That's in a lot of these new fake um, meat things. Uh, I have patients who swear by the Impossible Burger. I love Beyond, uh, I think it's called Beyond Meat. I like their Italian sausages. Oh, I don't know if I'm supposed to be advertising. I'm not, I don't have any stock in these things. But um, pea protein is good. And I think I mentioned quinoa before. Quinoa is that South American grain. It looks like couscous it, and it tastes kind of like that. It's, it's pretty good. It's got a nutty flavor and it has six grams of protein. Um, yes, you can get protein uh, without doing uh, meats because I know that there are some people who are vegetarian or vegan for many different reasons. Thank you. We do have a question around, um, this is actually, there's a couple questions around this about um, are there good, uh, potentially I'm guessing they're asking about whether foods or supplements or drugs for someone who doesn't make cortisol due to pituitary hyperthalamus issues? Yeah, that's, you need steroids, you need cortisol. I mean, there's no getting around it. I, I don't think you can take a food that has cortisol. It's a, it's a hormone. So unfortunately, if for patients who have been on prednisone or other steroids for a long time, it suppresses your ability to make steroids. So and you need it. So if you have to be on steroids, you have to be on steroids, I'm sorry. But if you can get down to a low dose, like six or seven milligrams, your body makes about six or seven milligrams a day. So if that's all you need, I have patients who are on five to 10 
for the rest of their life and they're okay. If you manage your weight, doing all the other things we just talked about, exercise and, and nutrition, um, you'll be okay. But you also have to get your eyes checked and your bones checked and all those things. We just have to be very, very careful. Cataracts is a big thing. Make sure you get your daily, uh, your, or, I'm sorry, your yearly checks with your ophthalmologist because I've had a few patients develop a pretty bad cataracts even with low dose steroids. Thank you. So our final question um, is, are you, could you discuss your thoughts on cooking oils, cooking with butter or substitutes if you're broiling or grilling, et cetera? So I'm not, my father, who's an internist, loves all these. He can tell me about all the carbon chains <laughs> in the different kinds of oils. But I think olive oil is just a good enough generic oil that's good. Um, I've what the, it's, a, it's a little bit safer, you know, the sprays, and I'm guilty of using the sprays because they're zero calorie, that you don't know what's in the propellant, right? Even though if it's organic, you know, pressed virgin oil, extra virgin uh, olive oil, you still don't know what's in the chemical to make it. So one of the safest things you can do is just take um, olive oil, real olive oil, and you go to Bed Bath & Beyond and you buy a spray bottle and then you just put it in the spray bottle and you just spray it yourself. So that's probably one of the safest things. Excellent, thank you. All right, guys. So I know we didn't get to everybody's questions. We're so sorry. Um, there just were a lot of questions and we can't get to everybody's questions. Uh, but but Dr. Tavi did, a, did an awesome job getting to as many questions as we could tonight. Uh, and thank you all so much for coming tonight. And thank you, Dr. Tavi, for a great presentation um, and great rapid fire question answering. Uh, we really appreciate it. And we hope everybody has a really great night. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs>